Today we have this really cool exponential function integral and the solution development and result are reflective of just how awesome the structure of the integral is. So we're going to call our integral here i for reference purposes first up and I'm going to perform a substitution to get things started. We're going to let e to the x equal u. Now this implies that e to the x dx equals du. Now remember that e to the x is just your u variable, right? So this means that dx, the differential element, just transforms into 1 by u du. Now what about the limits of integration? Well, as x approaches infinity, we need u to approach infinity as well. And as x approaches 0, u will approach e to the 0, which is 1. So that means our integral i in the u world transforms into an integral from 1 to infinity now of du divided by u times the square root of e to the x is u. And e to the negative x is the reciprocal of e to the x, right? So we have 1 by u here. And some simplification of the integrand is in order. So we can write this as the integral from 1 to infinity of du divided by u times the square root of u squared plus 1 divided by u. And we can factor out the u variable as square root u times square root u, and that should cancel out the square root u in the denominator. So we can write this as the integral from 1 to infinity of du divided by the square root of u times the square root of u squared plus 1. Okay, so far so good, but now what? Well, it would be useful now to shift to a trigonometric world. So let u be equal to the tangent of, I'm going to call the dummy variable x again. So this implies that du equals the squared secant of x dx. And what about the limits? Well, for u to approach 1, we need x to approach pi by 4. And for u to approach infinity, we need x to approach pi by 2. So this implies that your integral i in the new x world is the integral from pi by 4 to pi by 2 of uh, the differential element is now the square root secant of x dx divided by the square root of u is now the square root of tangent x times the square root of the square tangent of x plus 1. And we know that tangent squared plus 1 equals the squared secant function from basic trig uh, trigonometry, right? So we have some nice cancellations taking place here. First up, I can write this as the linear secant of x term. And I can get rid of one of these secant functions as well. So that means I now have the integral from pi by 4 to pi by 2 of the secant of x times the tangent of x to the negative one half, right? And expanding the secant and the tangent functions, I can write this as the integral from pi by four to pi by two of the reciprocal of the cosine of x times the cosine of x to the one half divided by the sine of x to the one half again. So after some cancellation for the cosine functions, I have the integral from pi by 4 to pi by 2 of the cosine of x to the negative 1 half and the sine of x to the negative 1 half as well, dx. And we're integrating on the interval from pi by 4 to pi by 2. And this is a bit discomforting. I I'd much rather integrate from 0 to pi by 2 so that I can apply a form of the beta function. So we'll get to that point later. First up, we need, to, we need to deal with these limits. Well, notice that the integral from 0 to pi by 2 equals the integral from 0 to pi by 4 plus the integral from pi by 4 to pi by 2, right? So this implies that the integral we have, that is the integral from pi by 4 to pi by 2, equals the integral from 0 to pi by 2 minus the integral from 0 to pi by 4. So this implies that we can write our integral i as the integral from 0 to pi by 2 plus the, uh, sorry about that, minus the integral from 0 to pi by 4 of 
the cosine of x to the negative one half times the sine to the negative one half of x dx. And I'm gonna call the first of these integrals i sub one and the second one i sub two. So all we have to do is evaluate these two integrals and subtract the results. For the first of these integrals, that is i sub one, we can invoke the geometric representation of the beta function. Now the beta function with complex arguments s and t equals twice the integral from zero to pi by two of the cosine to the two s minus one of x times the sine to the two t minus one of x dx. So on comparing the coefficients, we see that two s minus one equals negative one half, which implies that s should be equal to one by four, and the same for the t variable. And also because of this factor of two, this implies that i sub one is actually one half of the beta function evaluated at one by four and one by four. And now to invoke the beautiful relationship between the beta and the gamma functions, we have one half gamma one by four times gamma one by four divided by gamma one by four plus one by four. So upstairs in the numerator, we have the square of the gamma function at one by four, and we have gamma one half in the denominator, which famously equals the square root of pi. So that was pretty easy. That's the story wrapped up for i sub one. Now, what about i sub two? Now i sub two looks a lot like the beta function, but the problem is for the geometric representation of the beta function, we have to integrate from zero to pi by two, which is not the case. We're integrating from zero to pi by four. But thankfully, there's a way to resolve the issue. And the reason for that is the cosine of x and the sine of x are both raised to the same exponent, that is negative one half. So I can write i sub two as the integral from zero to pi by four of twice the cosine of x times sine x to the negative one half, provided that I balance it out with a reciprocal of two to the negative one half, which of course I can write as the square root of two. And we know from basic trigonometry that this here is the double angle formula for the sine function. So we have square root two times the integral from zero to pi by four of sine to the negative one half two x dx. And now one more transformation. Let two x equal t. So this implies that dx equals one half of dt. Now as x approaches pi by four, t, which is twice of x, approaches pi by two. So that fixes up, fixes up our problem regarding the limits of integration. So this implies that i sub two equals square root two times the integral from zero to pi by two of sine to the negative one half of t dt divided by two. So I'm just gonna write that outside here. And now I have an integral on which I can apply the beta function. So recall that the beta function was in fact twice the integral from zero to pi by two of cosine to the two s minus one of x times sine to the two t minus one. Wait, I'm already using t as a variable of integration, so let's mix stuff up a bit. So let's mix it up a bit. We have two to the m, uh, we have cosine to the two m minus one and sine to the two n minus one, where m and n are both complex numbers in the domain of the beta function. So there is no cosine term in your integral. That means two m minus one should be zero, which implies that m equals one half, a convenient value indeed. And two n minus one should be negative one half, which implies that n should be equal to one by four. We worked that out earlier as well. So this implies that i sub two equals square root two divided by two times one half of the beta function evaluated at uh, the value of m is one half and the value of n is one by four. So expanding this using the gamma function, I have square root two by four times gamma one half times gamma one by four divided by gamma one half plus one fourth is three fourths, correct? 
So this is what I have so far. And gamma 1 half is, of course, square root pi. And gamma 1 by 4 and gamma 3 by 4 are related by Euler's wonderful reflection formula. So let me expand using gamma 1 by 4, multiplying upstairs and downstairs by gamma 1 by 4, meaning, meaning that I have gamma squared 1 by 4 in the numerator. And down here in the denominator, I have a structure on which I can apply Euler's wonderful reflection formula, which states that gamma z, which in this case is 1 by 4, times gamma 1 minus z, which of course equals 3 quarters, equals pi times the cosecant of pi times z, which is 1 fourth. So that means uh, this relation here in the denominator equals pi times the cosecant of pi by 4, which is, of course, square root 2. And all of this implies that I sub 2 equals square root 2 divided by 4 times square root pi times gamma squared 1 by 4 divided by pi times root 2. So both of the root 2 terms cancel out and the pi term simplified to the reciprocal of the square root of pi. So all of this implies that I sub 2 equals gamma squared 1 by 4 times, uh, sorry, divided by 4 times the square root of pi. And now it's time to piece together the solution. So our integral i equals I sub 1 minus I sub 2. And I sub 1 evaluated quite nicely to gamma squared 1 by 4 divided by twice the square root of pi. And I sub 2, we just evaluated it, is gamma squared 1 by 4 divided by 4 times the square root of pi. And factoring out the common terms, we see that we have a form of 1 half minus 1 fourth, right? And 1 half minus 1 fourth equals 1 fourth, correct? So this implies that the integral from 0 to infinity of dx divided by the square root of ex plus e to the negative x equals a pretty awesome looking result. It's the square of the gamma function at 1 by 4 divided by 4 times the square root of pi, which looks extremely awesome indeed. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.